Today, our topic is branding. Grow your business with smarter marketing. And when you think of smarter marketing, you may think of Facebook or Google Analytics or some kind of technological tool. But a lot of the foundational stuff that goes into great marketing is stuff that's been around for a long time. There's a process. There's a formula. And it's a process that when you look at the big companies, say like a Wegman supermarket or Billy Fusillo or anybody who is well known within the community, they've followed some of these steps. And it has to do with getting very clear on what you're looking to do. So we're going to talk today about branding, because branding is the one that people miss from marketing and advertising. Branding is usually the one that kind of gets left behind and thought of last. So we're going to do a super, super brief history of branding. Does anybody have any idea where branding started? It was actually about 5,000 years ago, technically. And this was how you branded. So anyway, this was branding. And the reason it was done was to separate cows from other cows. Do you know what a cow was called that was not branded? A maverick. It's funny, we think mavericks are cowboys, but it was actually unbranded cattle. And people hated it because if the cow got out, you didn't know who it belonged to. So, but the idea was differentiation. And that is it, the essence of why branding occurs even today, is because you've got to create differentiation between products and services. Then it was pretty easy. You know, you just branded the calf and you're good. But branding has changed with technology. So we're going to go back to the 1800s and talk about railroads in the US. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. What the railroads did was it connected the US and allowed you to ship products further. And so being able to do that, being able to market essentially to different places, forced businesses to label their products so that they could be seen further. So before, you may have had a local community where your product was going out six, seven, ten miles. Now you're going hundreds of miles, thousands of miles. So this changes how businesses start to look at branding. They look at it as, oh, my customers are now, before they, my market was local, now it's, it's national or very regional. So the technology changed how companies started to look at their labeling. Next, you get into the 1900s. So building on railroads, now you have factories. You can ship the cattle from farms to processing plants. Anybody ever read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair? Yeah, new sets of problems, new sets of challenges, new sets of businesses trying to operate and compete. You have bigger brands coming out. Things like Tide appears. Things like most of the cereals in the supermarket. Tony the Tiger comes out, post-World War II. This created mass marketing. Mass marketing was then pushed out by TV and radio. Again, new channels that were not in existence at the time of the railroads are now pushing out brands far and wide. The 2000s, we have another innovation. Google, did you know, turned 16, I think, two days ago? Think how far Google has brought us in 16 years. I'm a little scared to think how far Google's going to take us in the next 16 years. But the computer then changes how you're connecting with people because it's easy to now go worldwide. The market gets very complex at this point. Options. We were, I was talking with somebody before the program. Options are just everywhere. And we'll talk about this a little more, but essentially it's, it's a two-edged sword. One side, you have more opportunities to connect with people. On the other side, you've got to figure out all those opportunities and wade through all the ones that were there when we were shipping things via train, because those still exist too. So the problem for most business owners is figuring out how do I do this whole branding, marketing, advertising mix? And it is a real issue. So first I want to talk about branding, marketing, and advertising as separate components. Because a lot of times business owners don't stop and say, hey, what's, what's the difference between each one? And the reason is, is because you're good at whatever you do. You have your thing. If you're a person who does electrical work, you know, you, that's what you do. If it's travel, if it's marketing, those are the specific things you do. You may not be the person who understands Google or Facebook and the amount of time that it may take to push out things like that. Or is the television still a good option for me? So we're going to talk about branding today. And the reason I chose branding is because working with businesses, I've seen the most issues because there are so many options. The reason we did a circle around the outside of, of the marketing and advertising is because your branding should always be on anything that you market or advertise. 
any channel that you push out should be labeled with your brand. It's very important to make sure that when customers see you, they see you consistently. So say one of your marketing channels, and, and marketing for our purposes is how you get things out into the world. Your website could be part of your marketing. Um, advertising is part of your marketing. Facebook could be part of your marketing, but you may not be advertising on Facebook. Advertising is the one that people usually think of first when they think of marketing, but based on the changes in, in marketing, so remember television? If you could buy advertisement on the nightly news, you could hit 30% of American, the, the American population because there was only three channels. How many channels are there now? Yeah. Again, that was one thing I ran into early when I was working with businesses was I would, I would get um, calls from Time Warner Cable, say. And they've got hundreds of channels out there and sitting there and going, hmm, where do we do the ad buy? Is a lot harder because people aren't exactly sitting there watching the television. So advertising, television was king, the internet came along, and now television's still there. You still do receive marketing, and it, it is a, a proper channel for some businesses. But for others, now it's the internet. And do you do paper advertising? Do you do online? Is it Facebook? Is it Google? What's the mix? And all of these things is, is where the struggle is for everyone. Um, I was telling someone before, I sat down with a client it was probably two years ago now. It was just before Google Plus came out. Is everybody familiar with Google Plus? It's, it's, it's essentially Google's version of Facebook, but it's for businesses. Anyway, I, I had stopped on Friday night and planned out exactly how this client was going to do a reputation campaign, so to start to get positive online reviews. And we looked at everything. It was set. This was the marketing avenue he wanted to go. So I shut my computer, I went to his office, opened my computer at 9, 10 on Monday morning, logged into his, his Google Places page, looked at the screen and went, hmm, I have no idea what we're going to do here. Because Google rolled out Google Plus over the weekend. And so everything that I was planning on talking to him about, I was like, no idea. You know, we, we just went back to square one. And that's the issue is that, that the technology is moving faster than people can hold on to. But there's a certain way that you've got to treat your brand if you want it to grow. Since this is a library event and I'm a big reader, um, I decided to put this, this book in there. The Four Disciplines of Execution. Has anybody read this? The library has it. They have a one-hour audio form that does a very good job of doing an overview of the book. Anybody shop at Wegmans? No? No? Okay. Next time you're in Wegmans, go up to the front and look in front of the cashiers on the wall where all the managers are, you're going to see what is this big poster board. And it's essentially their scoreboard. They have set goals for where the checkout line should be as far as how fast you should move through. Because it's important to customers not to be standing there all day. This is their process. This is the playbook with which they formed that system. But they have every cashier, this is how fast you run through, the, through customers through. This is your average. And they have teams of five. And you can see how everybody is doing. And essentially, it's a, it's a scoreboard that tells them this is where we are. This is, this is the important things for our business in this segment. And I'm pretty sure it's probably all the way through the organization. If it's hit the cashiers, this is essentially how Wegmans executes and how they deal with all the craziness. I mean, think of how many things Wegmans has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I throw this out there because this is one of those resources and tools where you can use it to set goals for your business. And it's one of the hardest things to do. And we're going to talk about why. So here's the reality of business today. And this is laid out in the four disciplines of execution. Completely took the idea from them. The average business owner, how many, how many feel like every day is a whirlwind? Thanks, Matt. I believe the technology is part of what's doing that. I have a friend who runs a company, or he's, he's very high up in a company of a few hundred people. And I realized a couple of months ago that I could text him at 2 o'clock and ask him a completely personal question about something that had nothing to do with work, and he would, he would text me back. And then I talked to him about how many emails he receives a day and how high it was. And I was like, wow, wait a minute. Ten years ago, I would have had to call his secretary. Now, let's go 15, maybe 20. I would have had to call his secretary, which he doesn't have now. People go directly to him. And I'm watching people, successful people, people who are doing very well, are sitting here and every day is a whirlwind. Because people like me who are friends 
can interrupt them in the middle of the day. So part of it is the technology, but it's also all of the business priorities that we deal with as small business owners. If somebody calls off sick, if you have to go spend half a day dealing with an accounting issue, any little thing that comes up, who, who's the one holding on to it? Exactly. This is the whirlwind. This is the stuff that is the urgent that comes up every single day. On the other side of that's your important goals. There's the things that you should be doing. It's, it's being here. It's, hey, I need to sit and stop and think about how my marketing works. We need to put a, a plan in place. I need to hire three new people. We're going to need somebody to take on a management role because the business is growing. Oh, I've got to sit down with my accountant and really go through where we are in the numbers and what we want to do next. This is the important stuff that nobody is, nobody is going to sit there and say, go do that. But it's the stuff that's going to actually push your business forward. It's all the stuff that we really want to do that's on our someday list. That's the stuff that we should be focusing on. But there's all of these things that are pulling us in the urgent direction. So this presentation is going to talk more about the goals. It's the hard stuff. It's how you're going to get from point A to point B. And you've always got to be thinking, how is the whirlwind affecting me? So we talked about increased channels, increased choices, and increased complexity. And this slide we built overwhelmingly on purpose. Because if you look at it in the 1800s, you could go and say, hey, do you want to buy this thing? And the guy says yes, the guy says no, and it's good. The 1900s, new forms came out, and now there's more ways to get at people. And today, we didn't put nearly enough on there. <laughs> and this is the reality. This is why there's a whirlwind. This is what most businesses are facing. Think of this problem not in marketing, but in a legal or an accounting standpoint. So say the IRS changes its regulations. What do you as a business owner do? You have a, a legal issue at your business. What do you do? Yeah, it's, it's the obvious choice because, because they're doing something that's very complex. And with this complexity in the world, the same applies to marketing in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't absolutely have to be a professional, but you need to think in, in terms of how do we get people to help us with this. Toward the end of the presentation, I'll tell you about some free resources and different organizations that are in town that will sit down and help you with some of these challenges you're facing. But as a business owner, you've got to sit there and prioritize and say, okay, we're going to do this. You know, we're actually going to make a list of what our goals are within all of this crazy stuff that's happening around us. That's the challenge. And that's essentially where marketing is. So this is a, this is a point in the presentation that I really like. So who is driving your brand? Who's the person pushing it forward? We talked about important goals, you know, growing your business is one. You know, who's the person in charge? Who should it be? It's ownership at, at the end of the day. You've got you've to steer the ship. You've got to say, okay, this is where we're going and this is what we're doing. In working with small businesses, I realized really quickly that the owners were in charge, but they weren't the ones that were usually driving the brands. And this is existing businesses who have been around before all the technology came in. You know who was driving it? This guy. Meet Fred. Fred is your local advertising rep. He's the person who works for Time Warner. He's the person who works for the Yellow Pages. He's the person who calls you up or emails you or stops in and says, hey, can we meet? And you say, yeah, sure, which is a very normal thing for business. You want to advertise. You want to get your marketing out there. You're not a marketer. He's got the channels. Let's talk to Fred. And what I quickly realized in sitting in meetings after meeting with, or meeting after meeting with these individuals was I started to watch what the agenda was. What are Fred's goals for your business? What does Fred want to do personally? What is, where does he want to go? Essentially, he's selling advertising. We know that. He wants to do it in one meeting. Anybody experienced anything like this? <laughs> where someone comes in one meeting? If I could give you one tip, well, it's not the only tip I'll give you, but w one tip. Never buy advertising over a certain dollar amount in one meeting. Set the rule in your business. This, th this is one of the strategies we've used to really turn business marketing around. Never buy advertising. Say $500 is your small limit. If you're going to help the manliest baseball team, you know, write the check. That's not a big deal. But if you're going to buy a, a multi-thousand dollar advertising campaign, don't do it in one meeting. Make a business rule that you do not buy over X amount of dollars without 24 hours, without talking to your spouse, without talking to the cat. I don't care. Just don't do it in one meeting. 
because these people are really, really good. They're far better at marketing and they have far more training in their area than you as a business owner. And they do this all day long. Um, one friend that I talked to, I said, how many clients do you have? It was actually Yellow Pages was his channel. He's like, oh, I, I deal with about 80. And I said, yes, I, I see. It, it was just an enormous amount of businesses that he's just rolling through. And this is his job. That one meeting, he wants to go 45 to 75 minutes. Um, when I meet with advertisers for clients, guess how many meetings I do? Usually goes to three. There's the first meeting that they give me all their stuff. There's the second meeting, I go back to the owner and say this is the changes we want. There's the third meeting where we then definitely figure out the price. And it's very interesting watching how those things evolve. But you want to make sure that anybody that you don't know who's trying to get you to that yes or no, you know, who has that goal, is at arm's length, at least a little bit until they're trusted. Because he wants the highest possible sale. And again, he's going to collect a commission. And this is not bad. This is advertising. But for your business, my one recommendation is slow down if this is part of how you do things. So let's talk about Fred and how Fred comes into your business. One comes in in January. He wants to sell mobile advertising, let's say. Another comes in in February, and he wants to sell Yellow Page. The other Yellow Page one comes the day after. Two days later, the web guy shows up and says, hey, I want to sell this. A couple months later, another one shows up for the television. Yellow Page is on and on. They all have a different thing that they want to sell. What happens now to your business? You've bought from a bunch of different places, which isn't a bad thing. You want a good marketing mix. But what happens to your brand? Business owners are busy. Again, it's a whirlwind. Yes, I want to do this. I need to advertise. I've been doing this for a long time. And they, they go forward with the campaign. A couple days later, whatever the ad that they're going to run, whatever the, the marketing piece that's going out to the world, comes in and they say, yeah, sure. And they hand it off. You know, the phone number's right. The address works. That's my website. The funny thing is if you... If you sit down and you take a year's worth of media buying from a company from multiple different sources that took advantage of the free creative, because they all offer it, what do you get? Fred equals brand chaos. And I don't want to talk down on people in sales, because people in sales do tremendous work. But when business owners go with the free creative option and don't have something in-house where they create standards and say, okay, this is, this is how we're going to operate. All Fred has to work with is, you know, you handed him a pen and he saw your sign and I saw a business card on the way out. And then the yellow page guy, he looked at your website and he got the pen and a folder. And so everybody's coming from different angles. And so one of the things a lot of businesses struggle with, especially established ones, is they've created so much marketing material over the years that nothing looks the same. They don't have a process. This is what we call SOYP marketing. Does anybody have an, any idea what that stands for? <coughs> Seat of your pants, but close. Good job. <laughs> We're all guilty of this at some point. And with the technology changing, you're going to be doing it. What I, what I, the story I told you about the reviews campaign that we were looking to get going for that client, I went to square one after doing a ton of research and having the process all laid out because something changed. But essentially, seat of your pants marketing is, is not having a plan. It's a lot easier to just run in the whirlwind and make the decision. It's also very reactionary. And we talked about it when going through how people buy from Fred. There's no system for branding, marketing, and advertising. For your business, one of the best things that you can do is sit down and, and figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? And it starts in, in slow stages. But again, first step is don't buy anything without 24 hours. And don't buy anything on the spot or without your partner or whomever is involved. Be careful with, with do-it-yourself marketing. You can, but make sure that you have some kind of support or you're bouncing ideas off at least a small team, and we'll talk more about that later. And also, like I said, avoid the free creative if you can. It's good in some instances, but business owners need to make sure that somebody inside the business has a little more control of what's being pushed out. Because especially the de Fred's designers, I know I've, I've met a few of them, especially in the, the television advertising realm. They sit in really dark rooms and really small closets and they just churn this stuff out. And your business is one of many that they're dealing with. So that's one thing that you want to take into consideration is who you're partnering with. 
So now we're going to talk about how to create brand consistency. How to create a brand that when people see it, they say, oh, I know that. And they see it over and over. And what this does is this creates a snowball effect. Essentially, if you've done the work over time, somebody may have seen you for the first time three years ago. And then they get little things over and over that say, hey, I know who that person is. I know who that business is. Because every time you make an impression, it's called a brand touch point, essentially. Every time you make a touch point, people then have a reference to you. So let's talk about the opposite of do-it-yourself marketing or seat-of-your-pants marketing. Let's talk about being strategic. Strategic marketing starts with knowing your budget. It doesn't start with Google. It doesn't start with Facebook. The place that you want to start is knowing how much do we have to spend on this marketing. If you look at all the big brands who have grown, at some point they came to a decision that said, we are going to take a percentage of what we are making, and we are going to put that into some type of marketing. You also want to create a marketing plan at some point. Start really simple. You don't have to get into the 50 page. This is how we're going to do this and that. It can be a, to start a one page marketing plan. Just go really, really, really simple. Next, you want to develop what's called a brand standards manual. Has anybody ever heard of one of these? A style guide? OK, a few of you. If you run a franchise, they force you to use these. Another quick tip, if you know somebody who's a franchisee, go talk to them and ask them, hey, how do you do marketing? Because that's how businesses actually grow to scale nationwide, is they sit down and everything in the marketing department should, is supposed to, come out of corporate. So they have a process in place where they say, this Pizza Hut is going to look the same as that Pizza Hut based on standards that are coming from a central location. That's something you as a business should think about because you get further that way. Businesses are also proactive in marketing investment. And this is what the business plan will, will force you to do. It will actually force you to stop from your day, force you to stop from doing what you're doing. And you'll sit down and say, OK, this is the thing that we need to do long term. Has anybody started to think about 2015 yet? A little bit? We have. And that's, that's part of the difference is, is sitting down and saying, OK, this is what we want to put into the market as opposed to waiting for Fred to come and hopefully you know, save you. The other thing we're going to talk about is building a team. And this, this can be both people who you currently know in your network. Um, the chamber will talk about this a little bit later again. But build a basic team of people who you trust. People who you can sit down and bounce ideas off of. It might be totally different industries, and that, that might be great. Maybe one of your problems is design. And a business that you're friends with has that knocked out and knows an awesome designer at a great price that works for you. That's something that is, is highly understated in a lot of businesses because we get busy. But define a solid team. The other thing is rely on a trusted designer, especially if you're getting started out or if you're moving forward with an existing brand. It makes a lot of sense to find one person who can look at everything you're doing, knows your business, understands who you are, and will then work with you. And last, you should have a system for buying ads. When Fred walks through the door, which he's going to, you should have a system for how you treat him. For the businesses that we work with, a lot of times we'll give them an email that is their URL with marketing at the front. Fred walks in and says, hey, I want a meeting with owner. Owner says, email here. We don't take any solicitations via this way or over the phone. They give out a name, email comes to us, we handle it. It's been one of the biggest helps to a lot of businesses who are really busy, is to sit down and say, hey, we will just hand this stuff off to you. Tell us what's good, tell us what's not. Review it with us once a week. Because Fred has to play on your terms, but he's very good at, at getting into your business. So having a system in place for how you buy ads is huge. So has anybody ever seen a brand standards manual, a brand guide they're sometimes called? All right, I'm going to show you Jiffy Lubes. I love this one. This is the way that Jiffy Lube keeps everything consistent. There's two sections. The first section is who is Jiffy Lube? When Fred walks through the door, do you really think that business owners sit down and say, hmm, who am I and what do I want to put out here? It doesn't happen. They say, OK, what ad can I put in to fill this space to put in the marketing budget? The first part of this is, is what is your brand promise? You know, who are you defined to your customers? This is a really important step for business owners because it, it forces you to stop, sit down, and think, hey, you know, what are we trying to do here? Also, it's, the first part is Jiffy Lube's customer value prop, or proposition. What are, you, what are you trying to give the customer? The second part is the guidelines. And when you use free creative, people are having fun. They know people don't care. They say, hey, I like magenta. So they you know, make the J magenta. 
or they say, I, I'd like it to be a little lighter, so they make it lighter, or they eyeball it. So what this tells you is one on the left, you can see there at the bottom, it has Jiffy Lube's, Lube's proper logo. And on the right is all the ways you don't use it. Next, it goes through spacing. And this stuff, I, I, I geek out over it a little bit. Probably most business owners are falling asleep. But when you put advertisement together, you want to make sure that there's proper spacing. You want to make sure that there's proper colors. That's another big one. Did you know that there's about four different ways that you can communicate a color when you're either printing, making web? Pantones, does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. So the way it, an image displays if you paint it on a wall or put it on the outside of your building is different than the codes for putting it on the web or the code you send to a printer. All this stuff is very, very specific. And part of a brand standards manual will make you sit down and say, okay, this is our actual colors and these are the codes that we use. Many businesses, they will introduce a color into their business because somebody, you know, somebody like Fred said, hey, I like brown. So, you know, brown is the new promotional material for a lot of their print stuff. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to, one, find your colors, but also find colors that work well together with your brand. It's a very important step to putting out any marketing or any advertising. The last part we'll go over, and these are just a few simple examples, but is typography. So if somebody in California is making an ad or, an ad or they hire an agency to you know, build a website or a landing page, they hand this to them and say, okay, this is the only typeface that we can use. This is just the primary, usually there's a secondary and a tertiary, but these are all important things that you need to communicate to anyone who's doing advertising for you. So we talked about it a little bit, but brand assets, these are things in print. These are physical things you actually make. When a business owner comes and says, I want a website, they want a physical thing, but they don't think of those other two steps of, hey, we've got to define who we are and exactly what we want to communicate. They leave it to someone else. This also works for digital. It should all be the same and it should all be consistent and it should all be coming from that manual. It should all be coming from the same place. And just for business owners, consistency comes from the top. If the business owner themselves is not concerned with it, the brand will go everywhere. Another thing that I have found is it's, it's really good to be the business owner who's concerned with the branding, but have the super details person in your business, the, person who sees everything and you know knows if something is two pixels off, hand it to them. So they will be the person who keeps it consistent because this is one of the things that gets really tricky. So now we're going to talk about four systematic steps to grow your brand. It's a little counterintuitive. The first person I would tell you to contact if you want to grow your brand is your accountant. Any idea why? I learned this by working with a business client who had a very successful business. Uh, they had been around for years and years. They were very experienced. They knew their stuff. Their customers told them, we want this certain thing that you, you could offer us. It's very simple. It's, it's, it's the obvious next step. So about a decade before they took it, they said, okay, we will offer this service in listening to our clients. And again, they had a big business. They had a bunch of other divisions that were doing really well. And they were caught up in the whirlwind of everything. And when I sat down with their accountant, probably six months after we started working, and we were, you know, we were doing really well with the stuff we had, I said, can you tell me how everything's doing? And it was more of just a passing statement. You know, how, how is it doing? And he looked, and he said, this is good. That's pretty good. That's a little down. He's like, and this one's just a dog. And, I was, and, and, I, and it kind of floored me. And I said, wait a minute. They're spending this much on advertising and making you know, what they were making, and they had been doing it for years and years and years and years and years. And it dawned on me, this accountant should have been talking to us a lot earlier. So from now on, when I work with businesses, the first thing I, I tell them, anytime you're going to do any branding and marketing, ground it to your numbers. And this is the thing that, again, whirlwind, big goal that you should be focused on. It's easy to just say, yeah, you know, go do it. Businesses need to sit down and really, really take a hard look at where they are and figure out what can we spend and what should we be spending. So what you want to do is you want to make that appointment with your accountant and you want to ask him, what are our profit margins? That's the first step. And this is how businesses determine what they spend on marketing, when they want to grow. You want to figure out how are we doing and how do we think we're going to be doing. Accountants are also good because they're usually downers. <laughs> they are. They're always like, oh, this isn't going to work and that. They're very grounded in reality. Business owners are like, we could do this and I could go over here and 
you know, we could save the world. And the accountant goes, yeah, but there's your bank account. It's like, oh, oh. Yeah, it's, this is a, a big step. But ask him, you know, how is our business doing? That's really what you're doing when you're asking him that. How are we doing and, and what do we need to do going forward? Because that should be what's driving your marketing. And then ask him what percentage should we be investing in marketing? So I believe for most businesses, if you do those two steps, that's your marketing competitive advantage. Because you've got to think about it that most businesses, business owners are in the same exact place where they're trying to figure this marketing thing out. And they don't have a system and they're just, they're caught in the whirlwind. So if you sit down and ask your accountant and say, hey, how much can we really spend? And you then say, okay, this is our number, this is our budget. And then you strategically go out and start advertising in those channels. Do you think you'd have an advantage over a business that wasn't doing any of this? And so at, at the end of the day, I would say the accountant is the person that you want to keep really close and talk to him and say, what, what should I be investing? I talked to our accountant a couple of weeks ago about this idea, and he said, yeah, most small businesses have no idea where they are as far as, as, far as the numbers. And if an industry, and I, I think he used his industry, he said, you know, if, if an accountant did 4%, he'd probably just you know, take over everything because nobody else is doing it. That's your market advantage right there. So let's talk about step two. I think this one is really important with the complexity, is that you need a peer network. And this is where I would suggest to you as a chamber to look around and see who's in it. it it's a peer network of people who have no stake in financially. They're not going to make money off you one way or the other. They're people who are in the same position you are, trying to figure out the same problems. Sit down and find someone who, well, I, actually, I would back up a second. I would, find, I would find what you're really good at or what your business is doing well and see how you can go help someone else. That's probably where you should start. You know, what do I have to give in a group? And then go looking and saying, hey, what are my problems? What are our challenges? What, what do we want to face? Or what do we have to overcome? And then find the people who are doing that or who have done it well. Because I guarantee somebody in the chamber has what you don't have. So my opinion is find a group of, of advisors who can help you and, and make a list. Find out the technology context. If you really like somebody's website, email them and say, hey, wow, just landed on your website. It's really nice. Who did it? Or can I talk to you about it? Most likely, if you compliment a business owner on their marketing, they're going to be like, hey, great. Somebody actually paid attention. Does anybody know the Small Business Development Center? Familiar? They are housed at OCC. They're federally funded. There's SBDC is their acronym. They're all over the country. And they're there to help business, small businesses, but businesses with their problems, or their, their challenges, not with their problems. They're there to help them grow. Uh, they're wonderful. They're very, very helpful. You can email them, and they will set up a meeting that's confidential with an advisor. They're a great place to start. And the other is SCORE. Is everybody familiar with SCORE? They're there to help you, and they're seasoned business professionals in different areas that you want to learn more about or need mentorship in. They will help you. All right, step three is where you bring in the marketing professionals. Didn't you think it was going to be one? Once you have your budget, once you have a solid group of people, and, and this is, these are general rules, but start to bring in people who can help you. Start to look for people who can invest in your business, but find people who fit and form a simple marketing plan. And what I mean by a simple marketing plan is really simple. When we work with companies for the first time, we always do a three-month contract. That's it. We'll, we'll set a basic scope of services saying, okay, what are your challenges? What do you want to find out? If it's research, whatever it is. But I highly recommend finding a good fit. And it's someone who you can work with, someone who you know, someone who you can call up and say, hey, here's my challenges, here's my struggles. Think of them like your accountant. Oh, by the way, I didn't say this, but I need to. How would everybody rate their accountant right now? Straw poll. Anybody? This, this, or this? <laughs> oh, oh we, got a, we got somebody. Okay. That's a big one. Um, it, it should be like this. It should be somebody who you can call up in the middle of a, a Thursday and say, hey, I need to talk to you, and, and, and they're back to you, and, and you have a good working relationship. But you need to bring in people who are all like this. That's my very simple you know, rating for everybody on Teams. Um, but essentially, to start, you need to perform an audit of your branded materials, your marketing, and advertising. And that could be just pulling it all in and laying it on a table. So perform that basic audit. Just look at it. It may be a little painful. It may be a little tough. But it'll really show you where your marketing is and what your customers are seeing. Next is create the brand standards manual with a seasoned designer. 
someone who understands branding start to finish. And it actually might be two. If you've got a very heavy web presence, you're going to want somebody who understands web specifically and also somebody who understands possibly print. So it just depends. But that's where you go looking for someone. And you can contact the SBDC, look for friends, find people. And then the last thing you want to do is identify objectives going forward. Again, the marketing should go from very nebulous to far, far more clear. And last is the, is the plan for growth, and that's what it should be. It should be something that you've worked through. Again, the whirlwind is going to fight you every step of the way. You've got to know that it's out there and that it's working against you. But essentially, you've got to create an annual marketing plan where you sit down and say, okay, this is how we're moving forward. This is what January is, and this is what February. If you guys ever notice retail, retail has this down to a science. You know, they have the Christmas stuff out at Halloween, or is it in August? I don't know now. They're, they seem to be pushing it earlier and earlier. But businesses have cycles. So look at what your cycle is. Get a calendar out and say, hey, our biggest time is, you know, from Easter onward. You know, we're a, say we're a seasonal business. But look at where that is, and then start your planning from there. But again, again, I'm going to go back and just keep harping on it. The whirlwind is going to kill you. But you need to create monthly meetings at least with your accountant to check in and to say, are we staying grounded to the numbers? Because this is, this is how you're going to grow and make sure that you're not running out of capital. Again, monthly marketing meeting, or, or monthly meeting with your marketing team at least, but it's a good start. And then you're going to evaluate all the channels and campaigns. This is once you've decided where you want to go. And I'll end on this slide. There is no magic bullet. I'm sorry. I can't just make it all you know, better by doing one simple thing. But there's quite a few. And if you lay those steps, if you look at your marketing systematically, you will have an advantage over the competition. But you've got to make sure that you build a strong foundation, and especially as small business owners where we're doing it ourselves a lot, you've got to pull in that team. You've got to figure out that social component that helps you to push forward. Thank you.